Welcome to episode number 312 of Destination Linux. Destination Linux is a video podcast from the Tux Digital Network. If you're new to the show, Destination Linux is a podcast perfect for all experience levels. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the show for you. My name is Ryan. I'm Jill. And I'm Michael. On this week's episode of Destination Linux, we're going to be discussing Linux at the Oscars. How exciting. Woo-hoo. Yes. If you've never watched the Oscars before, you might have a reason We are going to slap this topic. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> then we have a Rust-based browser engine making a comeback. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All of this coming up right now on Destination Linux. This week in our community feedback, we have some feedback from Craggles. And if you want to send in your feedback, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash contact to get in touch and send us an email or join our forum. We're also on Discord. Want to hang out, game with the community, chat about Linux? Go to tuxdigital.com slash Discord. In fact, our feedback this week comes from the Discord channel. There was a topic, disappointment with shortwave radio app. And they go on to say, so shortwave app has now stopped playing any radio streams from Australia's national broadcaster, ABC. All of ABC radio stream URLs finish in .pls. None of them are accepted by shortwave as acceptable radio streams, despite previous versions of shortwave having no problem with ABC radio. Not sure whether to log it as a bug or not. Managed to import ABC's URLs into Good Vibes app. Fine. So Good Vibes is now my new favorite radio app. So this was interesting to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a lot of comments and things, so go check out that form or add your own uh, opinion in there on different radio form apps. But I haven't used one of these in a really long time. Like really I knew they time. existed, but I've been so addicted to like the streaming music services. I mm-hmm. wouldn't say addicted, but I just it's so easy to utilize them. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. tend most of my music listening is either in the car or if I'm at the gym, in which case, you know, I need something that's going to really pump you up. And um, I have certain songs and things that I like to play and pick there. But then I started just playing with this after seeing this forum thread and playing with the one that they actually said isn't working with the ABC apps anymore and really kind of enjoying it. Like there is a lot out there in these radio threads, this online music, things like classical vinyl HD, dance wave, BBC radio, R-E-Y-F-M, which I have no idea what that's short for, but it sounded like some cool music. And Metallica and Iron Maiden channels. There's all kinds of free music streaming out there. Because number one, not everybody can afford to pay for streaming services and things. And number two, a lot of people miss that nostalgia of just having kind of a radio where somebody's picking these songs, allow you to discover new music and that type of stuff. And you can create your own stations there as well. It's just very cool. So I even though this was a question more of like an app having an issue, I kind of want to use this as an awareness that, hey, check out these radio uh, website apps, basically, that website streams that play music. And if you're looking for something to, you know, fill your music listening needs. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't been using these applications for years, but I used to a long time ago. But most of the time it was like Icecast and Winamp. Yes. And, and stuff Shout like cast. that. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so there was there was a time where I would listen to like radio stations all the time. And now with the streaming services, I just typically listen to the streaming services. So that's that's an interesting point. Um, but you're saying that you go to the gym and you got to have some like heavy things. So you're saying like 105.7 smooth jams. Yeah, it's not going to be going to work because okay. you know, I'm, like, I'm not like sitting there. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm hitting them weights. I'm killing. I'm getting them gains, Michael. Got to get the gains. <laughs> get the gains. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a sort of a story. It's not necessarily related, but it's it's kind of somewhat related. But recently I switched from Tidal to Spotify uh, for the streaming services because Tidal started becoming glitchy. And it would only play like 30 seconds of a song. And it was like every song. It was it was like it was only demoing the stuff for some reason, even though I had a oh, premium. Weird. Yeah. And I, I, I think Tidal overall is better because the audio quality is way better. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Except for it wasn't playing most of the songs. So I decided to go back to Spotify and just kind of accept it and just go back and try it out. But I was glad I did because going back to Spotify was like rediscovering stuff I had listened to years ago. And it's been like four or five years since I listened on Spotify. So there was at least 20 different bands that I forgot that I listened to that were in my Spotify account. So well, I think a lot of people have cool. cut radio out of their lives. They listen to podcasts in their car. 
thank you. It helps. Yeah. Out. Yes. Um, thank you. They listen to podcasts in their car. They are, or they are using a streaming service where they have the music they've picked and liked. And what's cool about things like Spotify and Pandora is they go out there and kind of try to find music genres based on things that you like. And so you're discovering new music okay. like you had in the radio. But yeah. one of the things I disliked about Tidal as an audiophile, I liked the superior audio quality that came from it. But Tidal doesn't have really good recommendations. Like if I go into its recommendation or discovery mm -hmm. area, it's always playing the songs that make me want to stick a needle in my eye, for instance. <laughs> so that doesn't work very well, whereas the algorithms in Spotify and Pandora work really well, which is a use case for why having sometimes some data, metadata, can be a good thing, right? That's an area where this can help you discover new music, new artists, and that type of stuff. But at the yeah. same time, oh, yeah. you know, they mm -hmm. go too far with a lot of that stuff. But anyways, the free radio, you don't have to worry about that. You could just have a radio yeah. station playing some new music, which is cool. Now, me, I still love listening to our local AM and FM and FM radio stations, and, as well as my own, you know, curated music feeds. So I use Radio Droid for Android, which uses the free radio station directory at www.radiobrowser.info. I do enjoy iHeartRadio and Spotify. And I also use radiostationusa.fm where you can browse for radio stations by format, city, and state. But oh, cool. it only it, it's an awesome directory. It's a directory of, of all the stations in the United States, but it only works here in the, in the U.S. Mm. And um, I have used shortwave radio in the past and the classic stream tuner, too, on the Linux desktop. And I've also used uh, TuneIn and Transistor Radio uh, for um, on Android um, in the past. And my love of radio comes because I was a disc jockey for 16 years. Of course you, of course you were, too. <laughs> yeah. So, and I played uh, krautrock, ambient, and synth music. So, uh, yeah, and those are the genres of music that I like to listen to when I'm not listening to you know, the, the actual AM or FM radio. <laughs> so the nice. problem, Jill, is every time you talk, I realize how much of my life I've wasted. <laughs> no. Agree. <laughs> You've done everything. And yeah. I'm like, well, random spent topic comes 30 years forum. in telecom and that's about <laughs> it. That's all I got. Uh, wow. Incredible. I yeah. didn't know you spent that much time as a disc jockey. I know you worked yeah. in radio, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, and back in the day, I used to even, you know, I re recorded all my all my shows and cassettes, and I still have those. I have thousands of cassettes of my radio show. I had two at one point, um, and those would I, actually. That was cool. It was this is back in the early '90s. Got to send them to Germany, where they were played on a radio station there and syndicated. But you had to do it on mm. cassette tape. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. That's pretty yeah. cool. So, I feel like this episode is going to be like highlighting a lot of cool Jill stuff. <laughs> Which is always means a good episode. So Jill, exactly. I mean, I think for our patrons, we should be able to get a recording of one of your broadcasts yeah, and, and yeah. upload it. That would be patrons. awesome. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, keep reminding me. I do need to do that. I do okay. already have some digitized. <laughs> that would be amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> Speaking of radio, this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Linode. Visit linode.com slash tux. That's linode.com slash T-U-X. And see why over a million developers trust Linode for their infrastructure. Linode provides solutions and services to accelerate innovation. You can build everything yourself or use a one-click app from the plethora of options in Linode's app marketplace to deploy everything from Plesk and WordPress to Valheim and Minecraft. Craft servers. Linode even has VPN friendly virtual servers, so you can create secure connections over the internet protecting you on public Wi Fi. Wi Fi, Wi Fi, Wi Fi, Wi Fi. Keep your data private and guarding you from malware and attacks online. If that wasn't enough, every plan, and I mean every plan, comes with Linode's amazing human powered customer support. That's right, if you need help, someone will pick up the phone respond to your email, or reply to you on social media 24-7, 365. So visit linode.com slash tux to create a free account. Plus, when you use that URL, you'll let them know that we sent you, which is, of course, good for us and good for you because you're going to get a 60-day, $100 free credit when you go up to sign up with that account. 
So again, get started on Linode's awesome cloud platform by going to linode.com slash tux. Also, The Pseudo Show has a monthly challenge for Linode right now. Help build your skills and confidence. This month, deploying N8N, a powerful workflow automation tool. Prove your skills with your free credit right now at linode.com slash tux. Thank you for tuning in to WXGA 107.4. Yes. <laughs> Here in LA, it's 94.7 The Wave. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Oh. <laughs> that brings oh my back my gosh, memories. so good. All right. So I saw something in the news this week, and it made me think how lucky we are to have Jill on this show. Because this particular topic is something that Jill professionally has worked in this industry with animation, with movies, and can give us some inside scoop on some of this as well with the open source projects that are making their way into studios. And we kind of gave a little cliffhanger at the beginning here of Linux going to the Oscars. However, there is something really kind of cool happening in the movie studio industry and the open source world. And so we want to bring that in there. And of course, I want to see more involvement. I know things like Lord of the Rings, where they able to put all of those characters on the screen at one time was something that was only able to be accomplished in open source software. They had to custom make that. And so we're already, open source is already a part of this industry, but I want to see it bigger. And so does Canonical, which is kind of cool. Oh yeah, Canonical announced on their blog a partnership that stated that we are proud to announce our recent decision to become premier members of the Academy Software Foundation or the ASWF. This association aims to bring together members across the media and entertainment history to improve collaborations involving open source software. So that's the you know official statement that these companies make that the regular people go, okay, what is that supposed to mean? But there are other <laughs> cool tidbits in here as well. Like 2018, an industry-wide survey revealed that 84% of filmmakers use open source software. I had no mm -hmm. idea that it was oh, yeah. that big, I didn't know that either. 84%. I would not have guessed that. Um, and then the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, AMPAS. 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 A established a forum to increase the quality and quantity of open source contributions by developing a governance model, legal framework, community infrastructures, all the things that you have to do to kind of get people to collaborate on things and basically lower the barrier for creating or utilizing open source software in the movies. And ASWF itself is a nonprofit, and the foundation is supported by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which goes back to the beginning of the show where I said we could win an Oscar because that company is best known for handing out Oscars. So yes, yeah. and go. that Linux doesn't have an Oscar is seem it's just that's an yeah, insult. Yeah, that's I'm, right. I'm I'm offended. Yeah, Academy. <laughs> I do not thank the Academy for this. Should be taking the stage and getting an Oscar. I agree. Yeah, we yes, need text exactly. up there. Yeah. Linus needs to be, he needs Tux. to get the, the direct. Yes. <laughs> well, Linus I don't know. I saw from one of these reward shows, this person wearing this ridiculous outfit that almost resembles a penguin. So maybe True, that could Ryan. be the outfit we borrow for. If the, the penguin was also like an inflated tire, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to put that in post now. So people know what yeah. we're talking about. So yeah, it's going to be well, in the video version for those who listen, are curious. Uh, I'm sorry to all the British people because that's on your side. It's not, it's not our fault. It. That this, it's not this the U.S. This. this time. It's not us this time. Uh, members of the foundation include software and hardware providers, Adobe, which isn't really yeah. known for their open source stuff, uh, Unreal Engine, and nice. Intel, which is definitely nice. known for their open source contributions, to name a few. In addition to major media production companies like Disney, Jill. Uh huh. Nice. Um, I mean, are you going this weekend? I'd be shocked if you weren't. <laughs> this is, it is a weekend. Okay, next week. Okay, perfect. Uh, Netflix, which has been going through some turmoil recently with their new subscriber changes and loss of subscribers, but they're there. And DreamWorks, which, Jill, I know you mm -hmm. have a special affinity for DreamWorks yeah. there. And DreamWorks also announced that they were doing open source, more open source stuff um, just like probably a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. they sure have. That's really exciting. They were one so, of the first, actually. <laughs> I didn't know that there's also some big names in films and gaming that run on Ubuntu today. Like, I didn't know that Roblox was an Ubuntu, ran on Ubuntu. That's I didn't know that either. That's My cool. kids love Roblox. Like it's That's so cool. It's kind of like Minecraft, but then it has this whole world where you create your own stuff and, I don't know, themed worlds where people create things for you and things that you can go interact and play with. 
for mm. people who don't have kids and know about Roblox, but it's very, very popular. And Netflix as well is running on Ubuntu itself. So Netflix has kind of got some uh, skin in this game here. And Canonical is a leader, it says, in the broader open source ecosystem, which I would say they're definitely up there at the top. Yeah, and David the- Moran, executive director of the ASWF, said that Canonical is the leader there of their open source ecosystem. So kind of pretty cool to see all yeah. of this change. And so, Jill, how meaningful <laughs> is a step like this? Because it's cool to see these announcements, uh, but is this really important for open source and Linux? Absolutely. So, you know, having worked in the television, film, and, you know, gaming industry, and for many of the studios, I am was just ecstatic about this collaboration between the industry and Canonical because it will help innovate open source progress in the right direction in in the uh, effects and animation industry. And it's awesome. Yeah, a little bit about the ASWF. Um, It started back in 2018. And the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences teamed up with the Linux Foundation to launch the Academy Software Foundation or the ASWF. I've been eagerly uh, following this uh, for a long time. ASWF's goal is to promote, advance, and advocate for the use of open source software in the film, television, and gaming industry, as Ryan has been talking about. But that also includes helping media companies use the correct open source licenses. That's nice. So it was not just the software, but it was the licenses. That's a whole can of worms if you've never used open source software. It can be a little confusing. (laughs) The licensing can be very confusing. So having to navigate uh, that is really important. For sure. Yeah. And so, you know, this partnership is huge because for years, you know, the film industry has been dominated by and using open source software and Linux. And finally, we're getting recognition by the likes of even Variety Magazine are talking about it. Woohoo! We have made it. Nice. <laughs> Variety Magazine. Yes. I'm yeah. a huge fan. Next what up, we're going to get some, some, uh, some tabloids. Cosmopolitan. Yeah. Yeah. Pa- Paparazzi is going to follow around some software. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah, made it. What was the name of that? What's the name of that ridiculous? <laughs> the Sun or something? I don't. No, know. the show that says tabloids thing that's like always like um, parodied. Oh, I can't remember. TMZ. There we go. TMZ. Oh yeah, that's yeah, not allowed yeah. in my house. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't wait. Wait. TMZ is not allowed to be shown on the television <laughs> in my home, and it's like a rule I've had for years. Sorry, you just got me on a soapbox, but yes, we're happy yeah. to be in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. So and as are we? Was- <laughs> As Ryan was saying, all the major studios like Disney, Pixar, ILM, Weta Digital, DreamWorks, Epic Games are all part of the Academy and and have themselves developed open source animation tools. And Disney, for example, not only develops open source plugins for proprietary software, such as for Maya on Linux, but also for the open source Blender. And they have even open sourced their own Linux animation software that they use for their movies, such as for Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. So, you know, Disney has been opening up more. It's really wow. great. Something yeah. nice about Disney in the news for once. That's good. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, since the mid 1990s, all rendering has been done on Linux servers, which was a shift away from very expensive Unix servers. So there, were, there it, we just shifted from Unix to Linux, especially in the film industry. Right. Television's a little different. Television has, has more uh, Windows and Mac in there, but the back end is still Linux, and it's becoming more Linux for content creation. As it should. As it should. And, you know, most of the industry standard software used in the film industry is run and rendered in CentOS Rail Linux, but many now support Ubuntu as well. Mm. And in fact, Ubuntu actually is starting to be used a whole lot more for animation and visual effects software content creation and on workstations. In fact, I've even seen Disney using System76 laptops at mm. several Seagraph talks. And Seagraph is the world's largest industry animation convention. Jill, I just wish you knew more about this topic. Yeah. Right. So that we <laughs> could inform people. Why are you about slacking this. right now, Jill? Yeah, <laughs> if, you could, if you could just tell us more. No, what's interesting is one of our patrons, Neil, of course, uh, also on the pseudo show, brought this up that, you know, Red Hat has been a part of the ASWF for quite a while. So that makes sense that they kind of started Mm -hmm. here utilizing CentOS and RHEL and Canonical's wanting to get involved in that. And I say 
the more the merrier there. Yeah. Absolutely. Of course, Absolutely. it's cool that Rel kind of pioneered that relationship too. Yeah, so Canonical joining the Academy Software Foundation is really, really a smart move. And especially since a lot of the popular Foundry software used in the industry, Foundry is a company that uh, makes uh, 3D programs like Nuke, Moto, Katana, and Mari animation and visual effects software. I've used Many Nuke. of which, you know, I use in Teach, and they are now available on Ubuntu. So a lot, a lot of the that's uh, very cool. Yeah, <laughs> a, a lot of our favorite software is is having uh, .debs, <laughs> which is really nice. Yeah, it's huge. And and the other thing I want to mention is I actually had a nice chat with David Morin, the executive director of the Academy of Software did, Foundation. Of course, you did. Yeah. <laughs> He, he did a talk at the Linux Foundation event, the Open Source Summit North America in San Diego, California, in August of 2019. And the ASWF was actually still new at the time, and he gave a talk on what it was about and, and to encourage companies to join. There was only about 40 people who attended <laughs> that were in the room because it had just started and no one yeah. knew what it was. <laughs> so, right. and after his talk, I told him about how long I've been been an animation teacher for almost 30 years. And then I'd worked for several studios and he was very impressed with my resume. You and can't my have awards. Jill. Of Don't try to hire away from us. Yeah, you yeah. Ours. <laughs> no. And what was cool. Even though this I... happened in 2019. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> And um, I know uh, David actually felt my enthusiasm for Linux and open source and how important it is for the animation industry. After all, I was wearing my penguin hat. Of, co <laughs> so, of course you were. So he was, but he was very, very impressed. And what was especially cool was I was the only, there was a lot of people who wanted to talk to him at the, at the at the end of his talk, and I was the only working professional. Um, most of, of the people in line were students wanting right. advice on how to get into the industry. You know, that was wonderful, and I'm so happy he got to talk uh, talk to them all. But I, <laughs> when he looked at me, he's like, you don't look like a student. <laughs> <And I> was <laughs> like, he was really No, kind. you helped and develop so, the future yeah. students and, and yeah. you promote the open source stuff, which is so important. Michael, I don't want us to be left out yeah, exactly. This, this conversation. So I yeah. want to talk about some of my connections that I made. Cool. Uh, for sure, me instance, too. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I film and direct my own movies. Yes, essentially. You do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And short I, films. Channel. Short fact. films. That's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, short films. And I use industry terms like B-roll. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when, when the filming starts, I say cut the cheese. And Yes. Is that the right? That's term? not the right term. No. no. Oh, okay. No. Oh, oh, what is it, Jill? We have cheese. <laughs> we have speed. We have speed. Okay. <laughs> Close enough, is, Brian. Like Close I know enough. so many of these terms because I'm practically in Hollywood with my production uh, quality. You know. <laughs> we do. We do actually have some stories related to meeting people in media in a way because for those who don't know, Ryan and I met because of this show. So yeah. there, there is, there is that. So yeah. I, I met this this person who's in in charge of Das Geek Films, and it was, you know, it's so it's huge. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then when we came together, it was like Brangelina, you know. <laughs> 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 it's like it's like, big way. it's like MGM yeah. and Disney merging together to make some awesome content. Like that's what yeah. that's what it was like. So yeah, Joe, we have experience <laughs> too. But yes, you uh, do. I don't want to tell people just about us. It's time for me. Yeah, to we're just, not. We're I not going to be. That's, we would never <laughs> brag about I think ourselves. It's best or to ask you this Aww. next question, Jill. Uh, what kind of improvements in open source usage in the industry? We talk about this foundation mm -hmm. being formed, Red Hat yeah. being a part of it. We have Canonical being a part of it. What are some things that you as an industry insider, a true industry insider and in teaching this type of stuff, think that we need to improve on in the open source world in this arena? Uh, well, one is less reliance on proprietary software and more Naturally. use of open source software. Naturally. <laughs> and a lot of studios are already shifting, honestly, to the open source Blender 3D animation tool nice. and use Blender in their project production chain. This not only saves the companies a lot of money, but allows them to make modifications via plugins for their special effects needs, which can be unique for each individual movie or, or series or game. 
and more studios open sourcing their proprietary software so that my students and the community can use and learn it without having to spend thousands of dollars. <laughs> so let's talk about that for a second, yeah. because that seems like an obvious thing. But if you have been around college students, if you have nephews, family members and things in college, and you're not one of those that were just born with a golden spoon, then you realize that every dollar to them is budgeted. Like oh, yeah. something as simple as going to McDonald's mm -hmm. is something they have to budget and figure out if they can afford. Oh, and yeah. for instance, on certain forums with what Netflix is doing with some of their uh, stopping the, the password sharing with family members and stuff where it's going to be stuck to a single IP. Some yeah. of the biggest complaints I see are college students saying, hey, I was using my parents account. I don't have nine dollars a month. And yeah. especially in the U.S. where college is basically a gigantic very grab expensive thing and yes. extraordinarily expensive and so when you think about this like hey we have these budding directors artists that want to get involved in this industry they don't have thousands of dollars to go yeah. and do this so how do they compare against the student who does have access to thousands of dollars of software because maybe their parents are better well off and things and they can play with all of the latest and greatest stuff. And they're turning in their projects compared to a student who's only got access mm -hmm. to something that's free. Now, if you took an industry and you said, hey, mm -hmm. let's utilize, let's push this open source so that when Jill's teaching, she's teaching on open source platforms and tools and everybody has the same opportunity. Yeah. This is exactly. a pretty important shift here. This is a big deal. That's what I'm getting yeah. at. This is huge. I mean, for the last 30 years, I have taught proprietary software. I taught... Autodesk 3D Studio Max, I taught Maya, I've taught Modo. But when I get students that, you know, are, are barely can afford their next meal, I tell them about Blender <laughs> and, and yeah. Krita and, uh, you know, Photopea, Inkscape. And I, I let them use, you know, I even back in the day, and this has been like, Oh, 20 years ago when Blender was new, I would let them use Blender even though the class was supposed to be learning this other software. Oh, wow. That's you cool. know, so they would have access. So that was yeah, uh, that's amazing. In the, in the past, Ryan has mentioned that he would love to have had Jill as a teacher. I just wanted to say, based on that one sentence right there, it's like, it would be Jill would be the greatest Aww. teacher ever. Like, you remember when I turned in my art to Jill recently, Michael? And it yes. Was, it was yes. an abomination, but it she was. still found something in it. Like, oh, you use good negative white space here. And I, yeah. I was like, oh, Jill would be the best teacher. <laughs> I, I would leave that room still talentless, but feeling like a million bucks. That's the whole key. I, I, no, I would, still I would learn a lot, too. But <laughs> I'm just not an artist. I don't have that artistic mindset, obviously, for those of you who've seen the jokes that Michael's posted up there. But I love the people who are. And I'm fascinated by their minds that they're able to take these these imagine their imagination and put it into a form of a video game or art or other things. And I, I just love that we have uh, things like Blender that are starting to dominate mm -hmm. um, the market and take mm -hmm. over. And then even DaVinci Resolve, even though it's not yeah. open source, it's made available free to everybody to use. And my gosh, I've been playing with DaVinci Resolve recently, and it's just it's a whole it's different amazing. world yeah. compared yeah. to it very is, good. Yeah, yeah, it's even beyond Final Cut and uh, Premiere Pro, you know, because it, it combines motion graphics, video editing, and you know, uh, yeah. uh, color theory and just and color FX and all of FX. that. So much good stuff, and it's actually kind of interesting because it's a great example that we yeah. we would like open source software. Like, just to be clear, that's our preference, our goal, and all of that. We promote open source software because it's a fantastic philosophy. However, if a company would like to make their proprietary software easily accessible and on Linux, we're also good with that. So yes, good feel free. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And um, that was my one of my my next improvements was, you know, having more proprietary software from the likes of Adobe and Autodesk having support for Linux, just to have mm -hmm. support for Linux. Yes, I would love and, that. And I even I even uh, was thinking about this is one of the reasons why DaVinci Resolve is putting a dent on D Adobe's dominance. 
Oh, yes. Because it's available on all the platforms. It's inexpensive. You don't have to pay monthly. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you could just thing. figure out how to support them. AMD properly, that would be like... Yeah. You have to install you, those closed source uh, drivers, which are yep. a pain, but can be well, done. Well, compared to Adobe, it's kind of like the, the, you know, <laughs> Adobe crashes just as much as, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> true. as far as issues. One of my other improvements I think needs to be done is... Uh, some of the industry standard animation software only supports Linux command line rendering and mm. not content creation. So, and and one is one of my favorite companies is Maxon. They create the wonderful Cinema 4D, and they have a Linux command line rendering, but they don't offer the software for content creation to run on Linux. I'm like, so, come on, just make that final step. Change it. Just, yeah, it's easy so to they, change. So Maxon should really be Max Off. Is what you're yes. saying? Yes. <laughs> Max on. Max. So, Man, the yeah. Hollywood reference, Karate Kid. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Wow, Michael. Well Very done. good, Michael. I'm proud <laughs> of you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's it's interesting because we have so much knowledge from Jill and stuff. You take this headline that seems kind of interesting, but okay, they joined a foundation that's about movies, and now you can see how it's so important from a Linux standpoint. Kind of like when we talked about gaming and people were like, hey, I'm oh, not yeah. into gaming. I don't care about gaming. That's fine. You got to remember gaming's bigger than music and movies put together, but we knew it would bring a lot of people to Linux, whether you're into it or not. And it has. And I think this next step of the production side of things of being able to do animations and movies and things is, is a really important step for Linux. So this is a bigger deal than just yeah. a, a simple headline there. Yeah. And I thought, I think it is safe to say that we have slapped this topic very well. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well done. <laughs> So, you know, there was a big leak that happened with celebrities. It was really embarrassing. Celebrities had their accounts that basically their emails, they had a bunch of phishing and spoofing and things that took place. Mm -hmm. And a lot of celebrities lost a lot of personal photos and emails and things. And that's because they were using the same password across all of their platforms. And that's why we want to talk to you today about Bitwarden. So if you're the next big director or animator out there and you're about to go to Hollywood and get that big Oscar on behalf of Linux, you know what you need? You need a good password manager. You don't want any of that embarrassing stuff to get released. And that's where Bitwarden comes in. Go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started. A password manager software allows you a peace of mind knowing your online accounts are safe and secure. Bitwarden provides you the tools to store all your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords and usernames for you, and even automatically fill them in on the login form so you don't have to. You can access your data across many types of devices, your web browser, mobile apps, Android, iPhone, doesn't matter, desktop application, even the command line you can access Bitwarden from. And the best part is Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your device so you know you're the only person with access to your data. Go to bitwarden.com slash T-U-X to get started. And I mentioned you can get started for completely free. Again, if you're a college student out there and you're struggling, stick with the free plan. You don't have to upgrade. Bitwarden offers that for you. But if you're on your career and you love Bitwarden as much as us, you're going to want to spend that $10 a year to support this amazing company and get their premium account with a gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, Priority Customer Support, all for $10 a year. Come on. You get all this for less than a dollar per month. Go to bitwarden.com slash TUX and get started. And thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring Destination Linux. In the news this week, there are some interesting things happening in the browser market. Apple is expected to allow Firefox and other browsers to use alternative engines in their apps, which if you don't know, any browser on iOS has to use WebKit rendering engine right now, which means nobody can really differentiate themselves on the platform other than be just basically being Safari. This is, of course, thanks to regulatory pressure that they're going to be making this change. Then we have Bing Search Engine incorporating ChatGPT, which I think falls perfectly into Ryan's prediction of it take, taking over the search oh, no. engine business. I told but, you. But you then again, got me. but then again, Ryan, it's also Bing. It's so true. I mean, <laughs> but, but no, go even Google is though. That <laughs> yeah, but their theirs is called Bard, and it actually yeah. crashed their stock because yeah. Bard messed up and was giving incorrect information. <laughs> And it, but it is interesting because I knew that this was going to be a big deal for search engines. And if you played around with Bing, it's basically just an incorporated of chat GPT, 
which is the exciting part of it. But I think this is kind of a new wave of browsing in it, but it's got work to do because it can give a lot of incorrect information stuff. But that's what we're building on. And we're watching. Yeah. This it is new cool. They built it directly to the regular yeah. search of Bing. That is cool. Mm-hmm. And I also promote it as, as like, ask us anything and like, whatever form or I forgot how they word it, but yeah. it is cool that they put that effort in. Now, if we could just get it on duck, duck, go, we would be much better place. Cause I prefer duck, duck, go as my search yes. engine. Agreed. I don't think duck, duck, go has an extra $10 billion to invest, but maybe chat GPT can give it to them for free or something there. That'd be nice. Yeah. But let's, let's get back to the rest of this, this news. So, and there's, there's other news that's related to the browser market that we wanted to talk about, which caught our attention is Mozilla's uh, project that was called Servo, which was uh, effectively abandoned by Mozilla a few years ago. And it's reportedly coming back. So Servo was developed by the research wing of Mozilla, but was later given to the Linux Foundation as the community project. And there hasn't been a lot of real development since that transition. There's a few things here and there, but not a lot in general. So, and, But that's actually changing now since there has been a, a significant external funding that's been secured by the Servo project. That funding has allowed the team to put together a roadmap for the next steps of the Servo project. They're also working on outreach efforts in order to attract more collaborators, partners, and potential sponsors interested in working, participating, and funding the project. The goal is to work on options to get this working on Android and other platforms. And the question we all have is, will this be the game changer we need to break up Chrome's dominance, right? So can a Rust engine surpass Blink or Gecko or a a Rust specific engine? I don't know the answer. I just want to say yes. Yeah. This (laughs) This is exactly what is going to happen here. At least I hope this is what's going to happen because... I think the dominance that has been established with Chrome is feels like it's unstoppable. Yeah. And my hope yeah, is that sketchy. this type of mm-hmm. engine will allow them to differentiate themselves because it's not enough to get people's attention outside of us geeks and nerds and things that love this stuff. To get people on the outside's attention just to say, well, hey, Chrome's dominance could be really bad for people in the future. Nobody thinks past the most of humanities like goldfish. They go around the tank once and forget everything. So they're, yeah. they're not thinking about what the future implications of having one browser dominate the whole internet is. So how Firefox really needs to differentiate itself is as an engine that's giving you better performance. Not the same, not as good as, but better performance than anything you could get over there on the Google side. And that's going to be really difficult but maybe something like this, this engine could be a, I'm hoping, a kind of a starting path towards that. Maybe this could put them in a whole different arena. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Ryan. And I think it would be just so nice to have a third big option in the web browser engine space. <laughs> we, we need a third and fourth and fifth option. We got Safari, WebKit. Yeah, we do. We do. It only and works. Some other it only works in Apple stuff. Though. Yeah. <laughs> And um, what I think is interesting is having it Rust-based could be a big boon for Linux, especially with more Linux kernel development becoming Rust-based and Rust-based DEs thanks to System76 and others. So that there, there may be some nice integration of having a Rust-based browser, completely Rust-based browser, and, and uh, an operating system built with rusty bits. <laughs> And maybe the servo web engine could be written in the Linux kernel. That might speed things up. (laughs) Mm. That also might make Linux a little bit hefty for that. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. (laughs) Bloated. I don't use Linux anymore. It's too bloated. (laughs) Got a web browser built in. This project being, you know, revitalized is really cool because there's been a lot of great stuff coming from the servo project for years. And a lot of people aren't aware that this is not like this is not the browser using Rust because Rust is actually exists as a language because of the Servo project. Mozilla created the Rust language because they wanted to make Servo. And it's it's the kind of the funny thing about it's not like Servo is Rust, it's Rust is because Servo. And cool. all of this chicken or the egg. Yeah. But it's, it's Servo. It's, it's it's chicken or the egg, but Servo was first. But it's really cool that the reason why I was bringing this up is because a lot of people aren't aware of this other thing is that Firefox's Gecko engine has some Rust code in it thanks to the Servo project because they created Servo as a way to experiment and build a new engine. 
And then they decided to bring some of those stuff into uh, Gecko, which is when they, there was like, I think it was version 75, something like that, somewhere around there, where they introduced the quantum update. And the quantum update pulled in a ton of servo stuff, which is why it be, it was like a massive speed boost and stuff like that because it became a Rust thing. Now, servo as an engine is exclusively Rust, so it has even more potential to be faster. So I think that what you were saying about having a browser that a browser engine that is going to be able to you know surpass Chrome's speed and make it you know it can't be just as fast; it has to be much faster. I think that Servo has a massive potential to do that. And it was a shame that Mozilla kind of stepped away from it. But the fact that, there's, that we're seeing that the Linux Foundation, especially with this external funding, is bringing back the Servo project, I think that there's a ton of potential for it. It's very exciting stuff. Now, Jill, using a browser outside of Firefox is pure blasphemy, in my opinion. Ah. Uh, Agreed. Agreed. Very Agreed. good, Ryan. <laughs> so... Do you need a break from developing Rust on a piece of software and instead would like to throw around a piece of rusty hardware and kill gothic creatures? Sure do. <laughs> oh, cool, Ryan. <laughs> then the game Blasphemous might be the game for you. Blasphemous is a brutal action platformer with skilled hack and slack combat set in the nightmare world of CV Stodia. Yes, it's C V S T O D I A. So it's a little hard to pronounce. <laughs> But CV Studio. So you can explore and upgrade your abilities and perform savage executions on the hordes of enemies yes. that stand between you and your quest to break Suddenly eternal it's not as, damnation. It's not as savage when Jill reads it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now it sounds cute. It sounds cute when Jill reads it, but it's really Aww. savage, everyone. Savage. <laughs> <laughs> this game actually has over 22,000 uh, very positive reviews. And I really like there was a really uh, cool uh, review of it. It, it that's stated Blasphemous is an excellent Metroidvania with a fantastically realized setting and gorgeous, albeit barbaric, aesthetic. And it's highly recommended. <laughs> I just, love it. Nice. That was, that was wonderful. And honestly, I was really impressed. Blasphemous reminds me a lot of. Hollow Knight in art style and in mm, pace. Big compliment. Yeah. And it is very, you know, it is thematically beautiful and has a great story and soundtrack. And it pulled me in right at the start and I ended up playing it for over an hour. <laughs> so, nice. you know, it did its job. It, it really, very it's cool. immersive and pulls you in. And I was honestly very impressed with how responsive it was playing with the keyboard. I wasn't using a gamepad. I was just using a keyboard, but... It, it was really easy to use with the keyboard. I could really see nice. this being a really fun game for the Steam Deck too. Oh I don't know yeah, if you got a chance to play it on the Steam Deck, but this is definitely these type of platformer games like this mm -hmm. are just the they're type great of thing on the that, deck. Yeah, yeah. It'd be perfect for that. And you can grab it on Steam for twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents, or download the free demo. Yes, it comes with a free demo. <laughs> nice. Yay! I, I want to <laughs> try out the demo for sure. That's yeah. not fun because it's free, Michael. You're so cheap. You know, that, go support I, these I, artists. I like free, but also I like it. I appreciate it when a gaming company, developers, publishers, whatever you want to call it, when they put in the effort to say, hey, we know our price is high, but we can prove it with this demo. And then once you play it, then you're hooked and you go get the game. Like, I mean, really, I, think about I shareware. Like, like when you had Wolfenstein come across and everybody had the shareware disc they were trading to show yeah. Wolfenstein off. Yeah. Like, of course you wanted to own the whole thing. It was freaking yeah, amazing. Exactly. Well, clearly the amount of 22,000 very positive reviews, they know they got something mm -hmm. really good on yeah. their hands there. Mm -hmm. So kudos to those developers. In our software spotlight, if you've ever used Slack, I have to use it in corporate America. And let me tell you, it's a real pain tracking a multitude of various threads and things going on from a variety of different combinations of people. Like if you don't use Slack, this isn't going to make sense. But let's say Michael, Jill, and I could be in one thread where we're, we're all three talking to each other. But then Michael might create a thread where he's just talking to me. And then another, it's just Jill and Michael talking uh, to each other. And then Jill and Ryan are a combination that's in another. And that's mm -hmm. just with three people. Imagine if you had 
hundreds or thousands of employees <laughs> who are wow. using Slack, and each one is creating variations of threads of combinations of people with you. Also, in. there are different threads in other oh. rooms in, separate yeah. from those. It's so yeah. bad. It's, it's even so more complex bad. than you know large scale email email. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it, yeah, oddly I, enough, it is. I'm not a yeah. fan. I'm not a fan at all. I do not like. Um, but that's where Zulip comes in. Zulip is a powerful open source group chat application that combines the immediacy of real-time chat with the productivity benefits of threaded conversations. Zulip is used by open source projects, Fortune 500 companies, large standard bodies, and others who need a real-time chat system, allow users to easily process hundreds or thousands of messages a day. Zulip provides the benefits of real-time chat while also being great at asynchronous communication. Zulip is inspired by email's highly effective threaded model. Every channel message has a topic, just like every message in an email has a subject line, and channels are called streams in Zulip. So I haven't played with Zulip, but as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I wish oh this was gosh. in my company to do something to control whatever yeah. this Slack fiasco has become. <laughs> yeah. I haven't tried it either, but I have heard of it in the past, and it does yeah. look really cool. Yeah, and it even has a an official terminal client called Zulip Terminal, mm. and it's still in beta, but it looks great. I was really nice. impressed when I saw that, so all of us oh, yeah. terminal nerds will have something we can use. It's cool. Love it. Oh, that would be a good shirt, terminal nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Jill just yeah. came up with a new shirt. <laughs> Actually, I, that might, it reminded me of another thing she said. If we're bringing one of the topics we wanted, uh, the terminal is sacred. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Two shirts yes. right there, Jill. Yes, yeah. yes. I love it. Jill, Jill is just like plethora of so many options, you know, yes. of like that. Also, of course we did. Of course you did, Jill. It's going to be, it has <laughs> yeah, to be one that's too. the third yeah. shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the tip of the week this week is setting the title of your terminal windows can be useful when you're dealing with your multiple, multiple terminals at once. One way to make this is to edit your bash, uh, your bash RC file. Now, I haven't had a chance to try this myself, so I'm trusting Ryan here that he did this and it was- <laughs> That's a fatal error. Why would you try? <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe um, it. Uh, wow. So now um, I'm terrified if this is gonna work. <laughs> So but serious. set up in a virtual machine and don't try this on a production machine because only I have tested this. <laughs> exactly. So you go into the Bash RC with Nano or whatever you like to edit with and add this function for setting the title at the end, which will be in the show notes. Now, I'm not going to go through the full list of it, but basically it's an if this, then, you know, details about buys, changing the titles title, and creating and ed stuff. editing parameters and all this other stuff. So I'm not going to go through it because there would be a, just impossible to get the reference for over audio. So check out the show notes, the full details of what the function is will be there. And then when you do, when you do that, you can save and exit and reload the file with source uh, da source dash bash RC. The details of how to do that will also be in the show notes. And then just open your terminal and type set ter set title tux digital, and then boom, your title will change on the terminal each time. There are also some cool ways to make your title change to the last command executed and other conveniences to play with, but this should get you started on this tip. So d again, details for the whole thing will be in the show notes. So you know one of the most exciting things happening this year is scale, and the Destination oh, yeah. Linux crew is going to be at scale this year. You want to meet the DL crew, you want to meet Jill, of course you want to meet Jill. <laughs> of course. So then the 20th annual Southern California Linux Expo will take place on March 9th through the 12th at the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena, California. Come hang out and have the best so time of your life. Best yeah. time of your life. I don't care if you've been married and had a great wedding. I don't care if you've, <laughs> you know, summited some giant mountain. This is the best time of your life. Is gonna this be is the Mount is. Everest of, of conferences because we are yes. going to be there and you get to meet us. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Well, specifically Jill. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <Aww. But. laughs> and you can use the promo code TUX on the first page of scale registration to get 50% off your scale pass. Thank you to Elon Rabinovich. Make sure and yes. go watch Just that Just for listening to this show, you get 50% off? Yeah. That's, That's crazy. Awesome. <laughs> and also, scale is always looking for volunteers. Just fill out the scale 20X volunteer information form in the show notes, and we'll have all the links in the show notes. And I want to give a huge shout out that they received a generous donation from an anonymous Tux Digital Destination Linux podcast listener to cover a small batch of tickets for students 
and those who have recently lost their job. So if your finances are tough and you need help with your Scale20X tickets, DM or email info at sociallinuxexpo.org. And thank you so much to that anonymous listener out there. I love your face and for helping students and things out there. Info at (laughs) socallinuxexpo.org. You know, I can't. I so cal social. I, okay, it's so, too close. It's too I, close. It's so people. hilarious. So info I, I think, at s o c a l l i n u x e x p o dot org. Dot org. <laughs> yeah, what the best part about that is that no matter what, the only person who doesn't do that is Jill. Yeah, yeah. Of course. well, that's Both. because she's from SoCal. But yeah. the rest right. of us are not. So it's but, yeah, no, I, I, I never, I, I never recognized you said it until Jill says something, and I saw Jill laugh, and I was like, "Oh, he said social." Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering why everyone like, was laughing. He must like have. it was an anonymous donation. That funny? I don't know what. No, why is this? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, but thank you seriously to whoever yeah. donated that. We really do so appreciate. Wonderful. That's so awesome. Uh, a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. Join us on Discord at tuxdigital.com slash Discord. And if you want to watch this show live, you can become a patron of Destination Linux. And we have our patrons here right now, and they've got to see the whole show live. Yeah. Yes, they get to see all of the greatness that is, uh, uh, unfortunately, have to be edited out of the show. It's Hollywood. Time. Yeah, it's, it's all about, ho- like, this Hollywood the has director's rules, cut. And we have, and yeah, exactly. We have, we have to cut out some of the stuff so it's, it makes it into the amount of time that we have for the show. But there's so much more content that is happening in between segments and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to become a patron to get access to all of that great stuff, you don't have to be here live. If you want to be here live, that's a fantastic perk. But there's also unedited versions of the show where you can watch the greatness that is in between every segment by becoming a, t- a, t- a Tux Digital patron, you go to tuxdigital.com slash contribute to sign up. Plus, you get to hang out with us in the patron-only post show that happens every week after the show, immediately following the editing, or not editing, immediately following the recording of the show. So go right now to tuxdigital.com slash contribute to sign up. And also, if you want some cool swag, like the shirt Ryan is sporting right now, or the shirt Jill is, and we got some coasters and all sorts of great stuff, tuxdigital.com slash store to check it out where we have t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, stickers, and hats, and so much more. Check it out, tuxdigital.com slash store. And everyone head to tuxdigital.com and subscribe to all these great shows. We have so many amazing shows. We have the awesome Pseudo Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, Linux Out Loud, Hardware Addicts, GameSphere, and our virtual Linux user group, Linux Saloon. And make sure to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Go whatever football teams are playing today. Go Go whoever won. (laughs) Go eat (laughs) Schmeagles. I don't know. (laughs)